The podcast you're about to listen to may contain random lines from musical theater, terrible attempts at original accents, and a sincere discussion about mental health. You have been warned. Are you ready to start singing with your feet? Formidable! Allez, c'est parti! Non, nous ne sommes pas fous, nous ne sommes pas ivres, nous sommes juste dans la joie. Une joie profonde, nos cœurs, elles inondent. Cette joie, elle vient du ciel, non, nous ne sommes pas fous. Welcome to Sing With Your Feet. My name is Lily Fields, and I'm going to be your fairy godmother for the next half hour or so. This week, I am going to share with you some parts of my life. It's a thematic autobiography, if you will. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about our wardrobes and taking care of our clothes and knowing what we own and knowing what we like and what we don't like to wear. Well, clearly, the topic of shopping is going to come up when we start talking about clothes. And this week, I want to talk about shopping. I have a lot of thoughts about shopping that I'm going to save for another day. This week, what I want us to look at is specifically what causes us to own more than we need and sometimes to buy things that we don't even like, and a few techniques that I have found to avoid the temptation to impulse shop. When I moved into my first apartment, I went on a little bit of a shopping spree. This makes sense in one way. There are things that one needs when one moves into a new apartment. But when I think back to one particular day, I think that was when the dam broke for me. I have no idea where all I had gone, but I remember bringing several large bags of home decor objects back into the apartment. I remember gleefully taking things out of the bag, placing them where I had imagined them going when I first picked them out. And this could have taken 15 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, it could have taken more. But what I remember more than anything else that day was the moment when I went back to the last of those large shopping bags and having the very conscious thought when I discovered that there was nothing left that's all that's it there's no more and in that moment any good feeling I had about my shopping spree and about the new things that had just come into my new home they completely dissipated and I was left feeling empty as empty as that large shopping bag was in the middle of the floor Whether you spent a small fortune or you had an amazing day at the thrift store, when you get it all home and you get this flash of dissatisfaction, like for a couple hours, you thought that you had everything you could ever want to be happy. And then suddenly reality set in. I remember turning back to the apartment and the new objects that were there. There was a garland of fake wisteria. There was a set of candle holders. There was a lamp. There was a throw pillow. And as much as each individual item was lovely, the apartment was still empty. I stood there looking at that throw pillow and wondering why it had looked so much better in the store and then remembering that it hadn't been just one individual throw pillow at the store. Oh no, it had been like 15 throw pillows, all coordinating colors and contrasting patterns. It had been the abundance of the throw pillows at the store that had made this one throw pillow seems so beautiful. Seeing that one throw pillow alone here in my apartment, it looked like a wet cat. Or that wisteria garland. It had looked so pretty in a model dining room with floral wallpaper and a garden party themed dish set. But here in my white walled apartment, <laughs> it just looked like an accident. Though it would take years for me to take this to heart and to stop seeking that high that comes from owning something new, it was in that moment that I articulated that happiness would never be found at the bottom of a shopping bag. This has been a theme throughout my life. Dissatisfaction and emptiness. Those things have always been hovering in the corner, just waiting to pounce once I had allowed myself to think that I had finally found happiness that I could buy. 
When I was in high school, in the early 90s, I was given a subscription to Seventeen magazine. I remember reading the articles, looking at the makeup tutorials and the cute outfits, and I came to discover just how big the world really was, how much was out there that I could never have imagined before. And I remember trying to replicate makeup looks or outfits with the things that I had on hand and feeling like an ugly duckling compared to those long-legged, blonde-haired beauties in the magazine. In the bottom of my soul, I knew that those magazines were bad for me. I knew that there was no way that I would ever live up to that ideal. And somehow, somehow, I had the courage to stop the subscription of the magazine. When I think about it now, that took some effort, and yet there was something already baked into my soul that I knew that I was someone who was too easily influenced and that I needed to protect my mind from exposure to comparisons that would cast me in an unflattering light. This doesn't mean that I wouldn't compare, but it means that I knew that I had a risk of comparing and it did not feel good to compare myself. Cutting off that to which I was going to compare myself was going to be the healthiest thing that I could do. Comparing inevitably shows us that something is lacking in us or in the things that we own. And the easiest way to fill up that hole is to buy something. Isn't this the basic premise of marketing anyway? Create a need, then offer up a solution to fill that need. We don't question those manufactured needs. There are very skillful people who work very hard to make sure that we don't question a manufactured need. Like, if I want to be beautiful and happy, then I need to be blonde. Or true love looks like a desert sunset and dangly earrings. Or a campfire is where friendships are built. Whatever the messages were that I was getting, they made me feel desperately dissatisfied with my life. And the message I was hearing was, a poncho will make your life better. <laughs> It's so dumb, but comparing my life to those pictures, I found that something I could project myself onto, something that maybe I could have of that beautiful desert dream photo shoot. What I was missing was a belted poncho. I could get that. But you know what? I was not missing a belted poncho. I was not lacking anything. Becoming cynical about advertising is an incredibly helpful tool to help us stop shopping. But it isn't foolproof. If only it would have been so easy to see all the ways over the last 30 years that I have been comparing myself. I mean, I'm the girl who would see a friend wearing a cute pair of heeled booties, gush over how cute those booties were, ask her where she got them from, and then go stalk those booties. Whether or not I would actually buy them. It was like a compulsion to see them and to find them and see if they could be for me. If they looked cute on my friend, then maybe they would look cute on me too, right? So eventually, I went from comparing myself to what I saw in magazines to comparing myself to my friends. That's already a more realistic kind of thing, and it's definitely less harmful to my self-esteem, but comparing is never a good idea. My cynicism about advertising cannot be translated to friendships. That's not healthy. I needed to stop wanting things that weren't mine and could never be mine. In 2021, I made a decision to not shop for clothes for an entire year. I've told you that before, but I had a whole bunch of rules that I made for myself during that year. One of the rules was that I needed to stop coveting. Now, let's agree that the word covet has a connotation to it that is uh, not what I'm talking about here. The way I meant covet was that I needed to stop wanting things that were not or could never be mine. But to say you need to stop coveting and to actually stop coveting are two very separate things. Coveting is a thought and sometimes not even a conscious thought. It's, it's a feeling like Ooh, I like that. And then a feel-good kind of rush that is followed by the thought, I need that. Whether it's a pair of shoes or a throw pillow or a set of dishes or a sweater set, coveting is the connection between that thought of I like that and I need that. To stop coveting is to learn how to separate the two ideas. So for the first month or so of my buy no clothes challenge, 
for which one of my rules was that I needed to learn how to stop coveting, I made it a rule that every single time I would have a covetous thought, I would have to write it down. This included, oh, I love those aqua sneakers that that guy is wearing. I wonder where he got them. And, oh, this little bubble wand is so cute. That would make my kids happy. Whether or not it was closed, I was always paying attention to the covetous thoughts. From the moment that an I like this thought popped into my head, it was almost always paired with an I need this or I should own this thought. I didn't make myself write them down to shame myself. I wanted to be as clinical as I could in this process. The goal was to stop doing things that were going to make me shop. And one of the things was that I was having these covetous little thoughts. So studying them was the only way I knew how to challenge them and then to eliminate them. I certainly wasn't proud about the 20 or so covetous thoughts I would have per day at the beginning of my challenge. The act of writing down the thoughts was useful. It became like aversion therapy. I didn't want to have to write down a thought. So I could start to sense when one would be forming and I would intentionally redirect the thought. Learning to be grateful and to verbalize something that I was grateful for was an enormous boon to stopping those covetous thoughts in their tracks. For example, those cute aqua sneakers. Well, instead of dwelling on those sneakers, I would take a conscious look at my feet and the boots I was wearing and I said, wow, it's amazing how long these boots have lasted. And wow, I still like them as much as I did the first day. It didn't take long before the covetous thoughts started to come under control. Gratefulness and contentment suffocate covetousness. As I trained myself to redirect my thoughts, I was able to uncover a cycle in which I had lived for most of my life. I, for that year, stubbornly decided that I would buy no clothes and I had every intention of sticking to it. So I needed to study my thoughts. But in those first two months or so, I experienced a flood of memories, recent memories, from the time just before I started my challenge, which proved to me that I was onto something by trying to separate out the thought of, I like this, from the, I need to own this thought. Actively paying attention to my thoughts during this period helped me discover a kind of vicious cycle that I had lived in for most of my life. I called this cycle the cycle of the imperfect life. I later discovered that there was a real psychological term for this cycle, and it's called the hedonic treadmill, which pretty much sums up the experience. But because I hadn't landed on the concept of the hedonic treadmill yet, I really had to examine my thoughts and experiences and put words to them, which was actually very helpful for me to start combating the problem instead of just reading about something else that somebody had discovered once. So this is what I discovered my own cycle looked like. Number one, see thing, love thing, want thing. Number two, connive to obtain thing. Number three, anticipate how thing will make my life perfect. Number four, become inevitably disappointed when the thing does not make my life perfect. And number five, develop self-contempt and buyer's remorse when thing does not make life perfect. And finally, number six, start seeking a new thing to make life perfect. Rinse, repeat. This cycle is born in the desire to have a perfect life, which is on its face a laudable desire. Who doesn't want a perfect life, right? It's born of a comparison to what I see, whether it's out in the wild or in advertising. Comparison is the mother of dissatisfaction. But the problem is twofold. Firstly, living as we do on Earth One, there is no such thing as a perfect life. An ideal life? Maybe. More than maybe. Absolutely. But perfect? Nope. Secondly, most of the time we don't have enough foresight to know what would make our life perfect at any given phase of it. And even then, it will be perfect for only a moment. We really only know what was perfect once it's gone. Last week, I told you about Jennifer L. Scott and her 10-item wardrobe and how she inspired me to want to wear my pretty clothes. Well, it didn't take long for me to start following her videos and comparing myself to her and to her lifestyle. She was always so put together, and I wanted that for myself, too. In the months leading up to my challenge, so in about November 2019, I had bought myself a pair of leggings because I wanted 
to be able to wear my collection of pretty dresses in the cold weather just like Jennifer L. Scott. This was before I discovered the beauty of wool tights, which has incidentally changed my life. I included them on an online order from a sporting goods store that included some shoes and some pants for my boys. Apparently, I overestimated my size, which I guess is a good problem to have, but I still liked the feeling of the leggings, and since I was able to wear them with dresses that didn't show off the saggy baggy elephantish knees, I decided to hang on to them. These things did genuinely make me happy. With those leggings, I could start wearing my dresses in winter. This was the first phase of me starting to wear the pretty clothes and to really being in love with my closet. However, I started thinking that Jennifer L. Scott probably would never own a pair of saggy baggy knee leggings and that having a pair that actually fit that didn't bag at the knees would make me happier. I started thinking about how I would get to the brick and mortar sporting goods store and purchase a pair in the right size. I started conniving to obtain the thing. Although I desperately wanted to stop buying clothes, I started thinking about how this new pair of leggings would make all my problems go away. Now I could wear skirts that were above the knee in the middle of winter. Now I could feel super cute. My life was going to be so much better. Well, now I was into the conniving phase. I was always on a lookout for an excuse to go to the sporting goods store. And it turns out I finally got the excuse I needed. We needed a new needle for our pump so that we could pump up our sadly deflated collection of footballs. Perfect. But guess what? They didn't have the leggings I wanted at that store. Nope. But what they did have was a more expensive, extremely beautiful pair of leggings that looked like they were made out of lace, but were actually really sturdy workout leggings. Oh, now I thought, if I just had these leggings, then I could be super dressed up and cute and warm. But they were expensive. Definitely more money than I would usually spend on myself. So I returned home empty-handed, but for that pump. But I had opened Pandora's box. I broke the seal. Now I was conniving to get something else. Now I had found the very thing, the thing that I knew would make my life absolutely perfect, that would tie together every single item in my wardrobe. And since I knew I was intending to attack a buy-no-clothes resolution for the new year, having something to tie it all together could be really useful, right? With a sum of money my husband had received for Christmas, he decided that he wanted to buy some new running shoes. He really did need the running shoes, but his desire to go into a store to buy them did not even register on the most sensitive of scales. So I offered to order them from the sporting goods store. Aren't I thoughtful? Oh, and I threw in the leggings both pairs, the black ones in the right size and the lacy ones too. Finally, I was complete. I placed the order. Except that not a half hour after I had placed that order, I already had buyer's remorse. It took a few days for the package to arrive, and when it finally did, it was really a toss-up for me if I would want to keep those leggings or not. Knowing me as you do, I kept the leggings, and I added them to my closet inventory, and I set about wearing them absolutely every single day until I could get them down to one euro per wear, which happened pretty early into that new year, that year of buying no clothes in 2021. Even now, when I wear those lacy leggings, I remember just how enormous that whole experience had been. The longing, the conniving, the imagining, the perfect life, the disappointment. But this time, I gave the cycle a new ending. This time, there would be no rinse and repeat. This time, I purposed to wear those leggings until they couldn't be worn anymore. And now, Three and a half years later, those leggings are part of several of my go-to outfits, and I know that they pull their weight in my closet because I keep track of it. The data has helped me to forgive myself for what was an impulse purchase and has kept me from making impulse decisions like that one. Learning how to stop myself after that experience has brought me a lot of joy. Vibrer, 
de sourire aimé. So, let's talk about impulse purchases. I want you to think about where you make the bulk of your impulse purchases. I know that there was a time in my life where that was Target. There is a shop in town here called Hema, where for a while there, I would end up impulse shopping too. They were cute little things that I would never have imagined needing or wanting, but suddenly seeing them there, a little pleasure bubble made its way to the surface and I wanted more of that burst of pleasure. So that thing would end up in my basket. Oh, there are our favorite clothing stores too. The ones we just pop into for a quick spin to see what's new on the racks. There is an affordably priced department store here in town, which is the place that I used to always end up in and they always seem to have an amazing sale rack. I wish I understood what would motivate me to simply drop in. I wouldn't usually be out and about to go into shops, but I always seem to find an extra 10 minutes to go there. This kind of thing, this popping in, was the kind of thing that I had to stop doing during my year of no shopping. I was perfectly aware that these were the places where I would discover something that I didn't know I needed or didn't even know I wanted. So if I wanted to stop being tempted, then I needed to stop frequenting the places that were a temptation to me. This seems incredibly obvious, but when I decided that I wanted to make a clean break, these were the kinds of things that I needed to articulate for myself. I also deleted my Amazon app. Sure, we were still allowed to order things from Amazon, but to avoid the temptation of window shopping on Amazon, I only used my desktop computer. And most painfully, I committed to stop going to my favorite thrift store. My favorite thrift store is not in town and it requires that I get into a car to go there. Unless I need something very specific, just about every purchase at my favorite thrift store is an impulse purchase. So I knew for a fact that I would simply have to prohibit myself from going there. I live in Europe and I live in the city center. There are not, at least within walking distance of where I live, any shopping malls that could rival an American shopping mall. However, in my city, The bakery, where one goes to get one's fresh baguette and croissant, or the place you stop to pick up batteries, for example. All these places are sprinkled in amongst other far more tempting shops. That department store I mentioned? Yeah, it's right next door to McDonald's on the main drag of the pedestrian area of town, across that very same pedestrian area from where I would buy batteries. Our bakery is across the street from my favorite sock shop. Oh, tell me you have a favorite sock shop. Am I insane? Oh my gosh, I'm insane, aren't I? (laughs) To avoid temptation to just drop in when you are literally 15 feet away is really hard. Or, for example, when you have a doctor's appointment, which is just upstairs from the intimate apparel shop, is there a better way to spend the 15 minutes before your OBGYN appointment than pawing through silk camisoles on sale? To stop shopping means that these kinds of drop-ins had to stop. In the first month of my challenge, I asked my husband to deal with anything that was going to find me in town during the opening hours of the stores, like picking up bread on his way home from work so that I wouldn't be tempted. I did not tell him why. I would just make sure that I would ask him to do those things. This wasn't very practical, however, and I eventually did have to start trusting myself. So I would learn to take the long way around to avoid the places that I, under normal circumstances, would pop into. I also had to be extremely strict with myself about window shopping. I knew that if I so much as looked at a window, I would find something to obsess over. So I just couldn't look. (laughs) This makes me laugh because I just saw the film Confessions of a Shopaholic for the first time. If you struggle with shopping and temptation, it will definitely strike a chord for you. In the film, there is a moment when the mannequins in the store windows, and even one early on in the film, there's a mannequin who comes to life a little bit to tempt Rebecca, the heroine, to buy something that it is wearing. This portrayal of store windows as tempting vixens really spoke to me. I had to put imaginary blinders on so that I would not catch even a glimpse of what was in the windows. When it came to not going to my favorite thrift store, You would think that this would be easy, right? I simply wouldn't hop into the car and drive there. But there were mornings when the urge to get into that car was so strong that it felt like withdrawal. It was physically uncomfortable. More than once, I had given myself a compassionate talking to, a kind of intervention. I knew that I was not strong enough yet to walk into a store and not be tempted to connive 
to want to buy something. And this, my friends, is how I was able to find time to do my closet inventory. When you start putting limits like this, you recoup the time that you would have spent wandering around the stores. Now, like I said a minute ago, in all of this, I tried to keep my challenge a bit of a secret from my husband. Let's be honest, I was not like Rebecca in Confessions of a Shopaholic. I was not spending vast fortunes on clothes. I was thrifty enough that my clothes habit was not hurting us financially. I was doing this year of no shopping because I needed to get a grip on my self-esteem issues that were pushing me to think that something new would make me happy. But still, I was rather certain that my husband wouldn't understand what I was doing. I know him. He doesn't like it when I'm suffering. And as I mentioned earlier, sometimes the not shopping thing was uncomfortable. I knew that he would say, well, if mending socks is so bad, just go buy a new pair. But that wasn't the point. I needed someone, though, to help keep me on track. And that is where my sister Poppy came in. While she did not feel a need herself to stop shopping, she was my compassionate interventionist. More than once, I sent her a whiny text message about something that I might have accidentally seen when I was out and about, and she would talk me down from the ledge. Stopping shopping is not, as shallow and insignificant as it sounds, it's not easy. And having a support system is really helpful. Husbands are wonderful, but they are not necessarily equipped to help us deal with our temptations and our self-esteem issues. If you decide to stop shopping, keep this in mind. Find yourself someone with whom you are comfortable sharing your struggles and who doesn't mind the occasional whiny text message from you. So here we are, that segment of the podcast in which I share with you my progress in living out the golden rule this year. Over the last couple of weeks, I discovered that I was, in my efforts to people please, being a bit too much. I realized that I don't like it when people are over the top with me and that I needed to stop being over the top all the time with them. So finding a balance between being me and people pleasing isn't an easy task. That said, I think I have found a way to avoid falling into the people pleasing abyss while still being me. The compulsion to be too much often happens when I don't stop to ask myself, what would I want someone to do for me? Like in that moment when I'm too much and I do the stupid curtsy thing when somebody holds the door for me. So here is my new secret for living out the golden rule. I need to slow down. I know this doesn't sound much like it has anything to do with the golden rule, but I promise that it does. I need to be slower slower to speak, slower to act. I need to stop jumping into action without all the information. I need to slow down. When someone does something for me, which keep in mind is what we are supposed to be comparing our own actions to, I want them to do it thoughtfully. I don't want people springing into impulsive mode as if everything is an emergency. I am embarrassed for people who do that. So if I want people to be measured and thoughtful when they do things for me, then I need to figure out how to do that for other people. Yep. So good luck to me trying to figure out how to slow myself down. All right, Cinderella, I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. You are amazing, you're beautiful, and I want you to always remember that. I am always so tickled that you take time out of your day to spend it with me. If you are in a place in your life where you would like some help to stop impulse shopping or you want to start weeding through the whys of why you shop i'd love to hear from you you can reach me on instagram at sing with your feet or you can write me an email lily at sing with your feet.com that's lily l-i-l-y be great this week cinderella i believe in you I want to give a great big thank you to Seven Productions here in Mulhouse, France, for the use of the song La Joie is the intro and outro to the show, to Matt Kugler, who can be found on social media as Matt-K, who sang it, and to Claude Equé, who wrote it. This is your fairy godmother signing off. Just remember, it is never too late to start singing with your feet. <laughs>